to introduce uh, Professor Thomas Francois. He is in the University of Catholic de Louvain, and he will present us a topic named Automated Essay Scoring, Where Do You Stand and Where We Are Going? So Thomas Francois is a professor, as I said soon, in the University Catholic de Louvain. He is currently leading a team whose research focuses on the automatic evaluation of language complexity and automatic text simplification and the automatic assessment of the writing proficiency of learners of French as a French language, just to sum up uh, his role at the university. Maybe uh, he will have to answer other questions on that uh, topics. But now I'm just going to let him the speech in order to present you uh, the topic. Thomas Francois, welcome, and I let you the floor. Okay, so uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I would like first to thank uh, Alte for inviting me. It's uh, really great to be here and meet all those uh, very interesting people and to see a bit what you, you are doing. Um, as Alassane said, I will uh, discuss a bit uh, where we are now uh, as regards automated SS scoring, and I will also more briefly discuss where we are going and uh, what are the opportunities. So you see, I will introduce if you so maybe my task is a bit difficult because if you work in the field, you will find what most of what I will say as well known. And if you don't know at all, you might sometimes be lost. <laughs> uh, I hope not, but so I will tr try to do my best to uh, satisfy both profiles. Uh, so I will first introduce a bit what is automated essay scoring, then discuss uh, the principal methods that you can use uh, and explain you the recipe. And then uh, I will discuss the uh, obviously now very pervasive revolution of neural network and especially deep learning that Nick has already uh, discussed before. And I will conclude my talk by opportunities and challenge. Uh, so, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so you know maybe that the first uh, attempt of building an automated SS scoring was done already a long time ago. Uh, by Page in uh, 1966, and interestingly, he had already uh, foreseen a lot of the challenge and the difficulty that we are we have been facing or that we are still uh, facing. Uh, another interesting aspect is that the, the field is uh, maybe not completely structured. As you can see, uh, there is a lot of uh, different name that can be used to refer more or less to the same field, like automated essay grading, automated essay evaluation, automated writing evaluation, uh, analytic writing assessment, etc. Maybe if, if I, uh, we can highlight one uh, important difference within the field, it is that some methods try to assess mostly the content. Okay, so they, they want to check whether uh, the student are, uh, is able to uh, provide a good answer and have good idea compared to uh, a good answer. Um, and some other are interested more in the writing skills, so in the really the language performance. And I guess that's probably most your case. So that's why I will discuss a bit more uh, this part of the field, but they're really both uh, objective in the field. So what is uh, AES? But well, it's simply trying to uh, evaluate and scoring prose through computer program based on uh, one definition here. Uh, now I'll discuss a bit why we should or why we, we can uh, do AES. Okay? So uh, here I have uh, brought to you uh, four uh, arguments. There are probably more and maybe you want to discuss that later, but they are generally the most important probably. Uh, the first one is that obviously it saves times. Okay, uh, so that was already a point by Page that 
Enfin, Nick said already enfin, this morning that who is happy with the classroom of 40 people uh, learning a language? Okay, probably not much people, but ideally we, we could imagine having one uh, teacher that can really uh, adapt the, the learning, give uh, personalized feedback, etc. Okay, but that's not the case. P uh, teacher don't have the time to do that. And so the idea of Page was to uh, provide, uh, to score, but also to provide feedback uh, to learners so they could really improve much more quickly and more efficiently. Uh, another advantage of AES is it saves money. And I guess uh, as a test maker, you are well aware of that. Uh, you don't need uh, if you replace one human evaluator by a system, then it's obviously cost uh, effective. Another reason is that computer can do it. Um, they, you know probably that computer are now sometimes better than human for some task. I will develop all, the, all four points later. And then the last uh, advantage, which is very important also, is that uh, a system will always be consistent. So even he rate in the morning, in the afternoon, he doesn't have a, a hangover from yesterday. So, I mean, he will be consistent and use always the same criteria. Uh, so saving time, uh, it's, I think, rather obvious that you can have a system that can tr uh, score nearly directly uh, the, the essay. So in my team, we are now uh, developing a system for French and we uh, are able to assess a written prediction in less than 10 seconds. Okay. We don't use deep learning. If you use deep learning like BIRD, it will probably take more time, maybe one minute, but still it's a rather quick, uh, it's rather quick compared to the time that human can uh, need to do the same task. Uh, save money. So there is an interesting study by McNamara and Lynch that show that uh, if you uh, assess reli reliability, maybe some of you know already that, um, if you uh, have only one rater and you assess, I don't know how, I don't remember how they did, but you assess reliability, uh, if you have two uh, evaluator, then your reliability increased by 14%. Okay, so it's really necessary to get uh, two evaluator, and that's why I guess most of you have two evaluator. And if you have a third one, then uh, you can also gain fi five extra percent. Okay, um, so it's very important to have two, even maybe three evaluator, but that's costly. Okay, and so if you can have one system instead of one of the evaluator, we hope that the rea reality uh, gain effect will remain and the cost is decreased. Uh, that's why, as uh, I show here, oh, sorry, yep. there are several uh, main institutions that already adopted uh, automatic essay scoring, such as uh, Pearson, where they don't have any human involved, which is maybe a bit uh, dangerous. Uh, but also uh, GRE and TOEFL, where they have uh, one human and one machine. I guess probably you know most of that. Uh, another rationally that you might be a bit less um, used to it is uh, the fact that now a lot of tasks can be done better by the machine than by humans. A very famous example is the AlphaGo. Probably you heard that uh, this system was able to beat the one of the Go champion uh, several times. Okay, uh, Go was known to be a very difficult task for AI. Okay, for long chess was already solved long long time uh, several years ago, but Go was really uh, more complicated. Um, so it's rather impressive, and more generally, you see this uh, framework that we use to assess. Uh, machine learning model and you see that we uh, try to improve the performance of the model with time and more data okay and generally there is here the human error on the same task and if you have enough time and data you can reach what is called the bias error which is the minimal error that we can reach okay 
And it, for some tasks, the bias error is the same as human error. Or, but for a lot of tasks, uh, and especially when human disagree, which is the case here in uh, assessment of uh, uh, essay, but you, the, the, the system can actually beat the human, okay? Uh, which is good news, I would say, for us. Um, and finally, it can also increase reproducibility and consistency. Um, so, um, we, you know, uh, I, gu I guess you know very well that humans sometimes have difficult to reach a good, very high agreement. Uh, they can vary in severity. Uh, they can have also systematic bias. Uh, so the, the, the machine, as I say, might help. Uh, and also there is this idea of negotiation between either human, there are some papers about that, but also the communication between human and machine that was already discussed this morning. And here is an interesting paper where uh, Williamson et colleague compare, uh, had human and machine produce holistic score on the same candidate performance. And uh, the human were asked to reconsider the case where there were discrepancy. And after that, about half of the score discrepancy were reduced. Uh, so it seems that it helped to have uh, the, the contribution of the machine. OK, so now that was the introduction. Now what's the recipe to do uh, automated SS scoring? You see, it's the same as any machine learning model. Uh, you just need, and that's the most difficult part generally, you need good data. Okay. So data that are uh, annotated regarding the, th the answer, the things that you want to model. Okay, so here the, the, the phenomenon that we want to model is generally uh, the CFR scale, uh, score, uh, but it can be other score too. Okay, once you get this corpus, uh, you need to define, to, to identify text characteristic that are connected with writing proficiency, okay? Uh, there are plenty. Uh, this is connected to the construct. Uh, so generally you have an idea of what is good writing. You can derive different uh, feature and we call that engineered feature, okay? Why? Because human generally have to think about what is a good feature and they have to implement themselves. There are obviously some system, and I will discuss later, where we don't need to do that. Uh, the st third step is uh, once you have the core, the data and the feature, you can put all together and uh, select your favorite statistical <coughs> model, or you can uh, s select different one, and you train the model. You can then validate the model on unseen data, okay? So what are the models that you can use? The simplest one, is a linear regression that you probably know. Uh, it, is, it has a very important advantage. It is readily interpretable, okay? And as we already discussed uh, this morning, interpretation is uh, now a very key aspect. Um, in, interestingly, even it's a, if it's a simple model, it can sometimes remain competitive with more advanced machine learning model, like in uh, this paper, okay? One issue of this model is that you cannot combine too many features. Otherwise, uh, it will overfit the data, generally. Uh, that's, but there are some solutions, okay? Because if we can just use a, a few amount of uh, feature, then maybe we will not be able to cover all the rubric, all the construct that we uh, define and uh, that we try to represent here. Uh, but if you use regularization, uh, and there are different ones, it is possible to have more variable entered in the model. Of course, some of them will be uh, dropped automatically by the model, okay? Uh, a bit more modern and a bit more fancy model is ensembles. So as you can see here, and in Ensemble, you don't train one model, but you train several models, okay? Uh, can be different types. So you can have linear regression, support vector machine, uh, neural network, etc. okay? And each of these models will produce one score. And then you combine all the score 
to get the final prediction. Okay? Uh, it can be through voting or other system. You can also weight the different systems. So if you have a system that works better, you can provide, uh, give more weight to this system. Okay? And there are several work uh, in the field that use Ensemble. It is a rather successful one. Um, then, before the revolution of the deep learning, probably the most popular one, sorry, was, uh, mo most popular system was support vector machine. Okay, did you heard about that? No, <laughs> no, no, most of you. Okay, so uh, how does it, wait, sorry. How does it work? The idea is that you have generally two classes. Okay, you can extend it to more than two classes, obviously. Uh, and you want to s distinguish between the two classes. So you see, you can just uh, draw a line, and it could be that one or that one, and it will work, okay? But uh, depending on where you draw the line, your model will be more or less generalizable, okay? And in support vector machine, the idea is that the best way to draw the line, which is generally hyperplan because you don't work with only two feature, uh, is to maximize the margin between, you see, the, the hyperplan and the different class. Okay? Of course, this is when data are separated, so separable, when they are not, which is generally the case in, on, in the type of data that we have. Uh, it's a bit more complicated, okay? but here I just give you the, the, the gist of the, how the model works. Um, so you see that there are also uh, different work uh, that use support vector machine. And also some work by Yanakudakis and Chen. They not only use SVM, but they also try to rank SA. So you can either try to predict directly uh, CFR score or any score, and you can also uh, just rank SA, okay? which is also good, especially if after you have some anchor and you say, okay, all those SA, uh, I can probably connect to uh, A2 because I have a few uh, prototypical uh, essay. Okay. Uh, another, so probably this model is the most popular one, uh, latent semantic analysis and other dimensional reduction. How does it work? So the idea is that you have all the essay and you have also um, so either the good answer or instructional text that you use and that also contains normally a uh, good answer or good thinking about, uh, so it's more when you assess the content. And what you will do is you will project all those texts in a very high dimension uh, space, vector space, okay? How can you do that? For instance, uh, you can have, uh, every dimension is a word, okay? And you just check whether the word is in the essay or not. And of course, there are, there are a lot of dimension here. The, it's only three dimension, but in this type of uh, model, you have plenty of dimension, sometimes 20, thousand uh, because it's a standard uh, size for the vocabulary uh, and then you represent each essay as a point in this very big space okay but the space is too big so it doesn't work very well to use this mathematical space and compute things in it okay so that's why we want to reduce uh, and for this there is a, a svd uh, that can be used uh, it's a mathematical technique that will combine linearly the, the different uh, axes and create kind of semantic field, okay? Um, and once you have, uh, so you will reduce the space and you can project the document in this type of semantic space, space, sorry. Uh, and then you can compute similarity between uh, both type, uh, between the essay and uh, the correct answer. And the closer you are to the correct answer, the best uh, you can find the best is the essay, normally, if everything went correctly. Um, okay, so for all those recipe, you need ingredients, okay? What are the ingredients? They are the feature. They are a text characteristic that you need to extract. There are plenty of characteristics, okay? Uh, the most uh, common one are surface feature, like uh, word length, sentence length, number of commas, etc. 
there is a lot of work also about discourse feature because we know that using just surface feature is not very good is not well connected to the construct um, also vocabulary frequency of word if you use more uh, unfrequent word you are, you are probably you probably have a better uh, command of the language uh, if you use better collocation also that probably you have a higher level in the language etc and obviously you can also detect grammar and uh, grammar, grammar error and spelling error. So in my lab recently, we uh, did a kind of uh, systematic review of the feature that were used uh, by type. You have the type, oh, sorry, sorry. You have the type here and also by family of language. So it's English, French, German. Uh, I think it's uh, the other Romance language. Uh, he, there's Chinese and assimilated language, Japanese, for Semitic, uh, and the slave, Slavic, sorry, Slavic language, and Finnish, probably. Okay. Uh, what you can see is that uh, well, there is a lot of surface and lexical feature, uh, as I described before. And for English, we are rather well <laughs> equipped. Okay. There is a, a lot of work that investigated. Uh, this feature. German, interestingly, also uh, there, there is a very uh, a lot of uh, features that were used. For the other language, is not so good, as you can see. That's for the surface. Uh, here it's the other part of the table for surface feature. Um, then you have other type of feature. So error-based. Generally, those type of error are well considered in the field, as you can see. Uh, part of speech feature, uh, they are also rather well considered because also they are easy to implement, to be honest, which is not always the case of error feature. That's much more challenging. Uh, you have morphological feature. Here you see that you can still work. Even for English, you don't have much of such uh, feature that were considered. Or at least we didn't find in the paper. Maybe we missed some paper. Of um, and then you have prompt specific features, so you, com you, you can compute the similarity between the prompt and uh, the, the, the essay. Uh, there are also other similarity based features, so that's the LSA that I just explained. Uh, a few syntax features, but not much, as you can see. Uh, a few semantic features, and here it's just for English and German. So that's, for example, the number of meaning per word, uh, hyper, hip, hip, uh, hypernymy, hypernymy etc. And some people also use a readability formula, which personally I don't find a very good idea, but uh, that's a choice. Okay, so uh, from all this discussion about the feature, you can see that if you work on, on English, you are happy. Uh, there are a lot of things available. There are also tools that you can use, such as Cometrix or other. Uh, if you work on German, uh, Thanks to, uh, I think, uh, in particular, Detmar Mirror and his team, you have also a lot of tools. For Chinese, it's okay, but for, for French and other language, it's not so, so okay. okay. So there is uh, still work to do if you want to have this type of ingredient. Because the, the thing is that now, with deep learning, we don't need anymore to do that. We don't need the human to engineer the feature. I will explain later why. But the, the, the system can, can create the feature by itself. Okay. Um, also, yeah, one thing that I discussed yesterday in my workshop is that there is not much, surprisingly, feature based on explicit knowledge that we use to define the L2 curriculum. Things like uh, English vocabulary profile, uh, can be uh, CFR Lex, but that's probably some not used much uh, yet, uh, or I don't know, other, other type of uh, uh, explicit knowledge. Uh, just a small uh, advertising for our work. Uh, so if you are interested uh, about French, uh, now the situation is actually much better than the one I just described because we have implemented and uh, ma uh, make available on the, on the web Fabra, okay? And Fabra is a French aggregator-based uh, readability uh, system to, sorry, I don't remember by heart the title, but it's a, 
so it's a system that will compute more than 400 features uh, from a text, a uh, lot of different features, so lexical, syntactic, semantic, etc. So nearly all the features that uh, I listed before are there, except a few that are really specific for uh, to automated SS scoring, but we are working on it. So we will uh, later uh, uh, enrich Fabra. How does it work? Uh, you can input the text and then you get the result like that. So you have the name of the feature. It's not very user friendly, but if you put your uh, mouse on it, it will, uh, you will get some help. Okay? And there is also documentation. Uh, and then what you see that is actually very, maybe original in our approach, in most work they use just the average of the feature. So for instance, the average lexical frequency, the average word length. Okay? But here we use a lot of statistical uh, aggregator, like uh, first quartile, uh, third quartile, uh, median, mode, uh, 80 percentile, etc. Okay? And this is something that is not much used in uh, the field, so it's probably interesting also to experiment a bit with that. Um, okay, so last slide about the feature. Uh, it's good that we can implement a lot of features, as you have seen, but not all features can be entered in uh, automated SS scoring. There are actually some uh, issues, some elements that you should consider. The first one, which is obvious, uh, your feature should be efficient to predict uh, the per performance score of the writers. Okay? So it should be uh, correlated with the score given by the evaluator. That's obvious. Um, second point is that you can have different features that will encode the same, time of same type of information or very similar ones, so they are redundant. And it's not very good to enter a lot of redundant features in the model, so you have to be careful about that. Uh, something that was already discussed, the variable needs to be fair. Okay? So you should not have a variable such as the age of the uh, the test taker or uh, the fact that he is a native or non-native or whatever you can imagine. So you have to be careful about that. This is rather obvious, but which is slightly less obvious is that sometimes some of the feature may actually capture this type of uh, test taker information and they can be biased. Okay, uh, So that's also something you should be aware of and, and check for that. And finally, a very important thing is that ideally the features should have construct validity. So it might be that the proportion of commas in the text uh, is very informative, very well connected with the scores, but uh, if you enter that into, into the model, then the model can be cheated later and people can put a lot of comma and then get a high score. Okay? So if you enter a feature that, are, that have construct validity, normally, uh, you should not have this problem or a bit less. Okay. Okay, so that was for the classic approach of automated SS scoring. Now we will discuss the deep learning. Okay. Who knows what is deep learning? Oh, four, five, okay, well, ten person. Okay, good. So you will maybe uh, understand a bit this buzzword. So first, yeah, it's a very popular. Uh, here it is a uh, graphics that show the, the proportion of paper using deep learning in all the main NLP conference since uh, 2012 and you see that it was about 40 percent already at that time and now we are much over 70 but it was already four years ago. I tried to find a more modern uh, uh, figure but I didn't succeed but I guess it's about probably 90 percent now. Uh, what is a neur in neural network? You have a neuron. So what is a neuron? Okay. So if you remember your science uh, course, you know that we have uh, the information is uh, brought to the nucleus by the dendritis, and then it's sent to the next neurons by the synapse through uh, chemical uh, transmitters. Okay. And there is this artificial neurons that is doing the same thing. So you, you get the feature here, can be word or it can be the engineered feature that I uh, presented before. 
they all, uh, you have also, you can have weight, so you can give different importance to the different feature. And then you collect all the activation here, okay? And then you have also an activa activa uh, activation function that you can apply on the sum, and you send the result to whatever, I, either it's the output or it can be another neurons that will also process the information differently, okay? Please note that if you have here a uh, function which is identity function, this is similar to linear regression, okay? And if you are, have the logistic activation function, it is equivalent to uh, logistic regression. Okay, so, but what can you achieve with one neuron? But as I said, linear regression, logistic regression are already interesting models, but we want more generally. Uh, so in the first, in the area of neural networks, so during the 80s, 90s, the, the model looks like that. So yet you have here the, the feature, the input, you have the output, can be the CFR level, and you have a hidden layer. So you just have one hidden layer, the information from the input is processed there. Uh, there is already a lot of weight, so each line is a weight, okay? So you see it's already a complex model, more complex than uh, linear regression, obviously. It's a lot of linear regression that are combined together in a non-linear way, okay? But still, it was not so powerful, okay? But with the deep learning, what you do is just stacking more neurons, more hidden neurons, okay? So you see, it's not magic. It's just getting bigger, <laughs> okay? But why couldn't we do that before? Because there were mathematical reasons that uh, prevent from training efficiently this type of uh, uh, structure. Okay, so I will not go into detail, but that's when someone found the solution that we were able to efficiently train this type of feature. What you can look also, that is very interesting for us, is that, I don't know if you see very well, maybe I go to the next slide. Well, it's not much better. Um, so there is a very nice properties of deep learning, which is it can encode itself the feature. So you don't need, as I said before, to, to tell him, okay, look at uh, connectors, look at lexical frequency, look at, etc. okay? He will be able to decide by, by itself what is interesting in the text. Um, and if uh, you, there are some methods to uh, represent and interpret uh, the different level uh, of information, for the information that is encoded and at the different level. And very interestingly, we see that there are kind of hierarchy. So uh, for the first layers, you have very basic information. So for an image, it will identify, identify edges, okay? Uh, lines, contrast in colors, things like that. Then at the intermediate uh, layer, it will identify uh, combination of edges, okay, a bit more complex things. And then you will be able to identify feature like nose, eyes, etc., and then finally decide on which face, okay? So that's really great because you can auto-encode the feature, but there is also a kind of logic in the way that it is encoded. And that's part of the success of the deep learning because uh, designing the feature, as I explained, is actually costly. You need to read a lot of uh, scientific paper to decide what you will implement, you need to implement, you need to test, etc. Here, we don't have to do anything, and it's it just, the model is just doing it by itself, okay? So it's actually great in, in terms of learning capability. Another very interesting properties of deep learning is the transfer learning, okay? So you can train a a model, a, a big model with a lot of layers, okay, on a very simple task, such as, for instance, predict the next word, okay? For this, you have, we have plenty of data, okay? So it's very easy uh, to train such model. And then what you can do is just keep the lower layer that have encoded some information about the language, and you can use for another problem where you don't have a lot of data. So you could, for instance, Train, uh, uh, train a model for, I don't know, uh, Estonian on a lot of data 
and then keep the, the model that represents Estonian languages, more or less, and then with only a few amount of uh, uh, essay, try to predict automatically. Okay, so that's rather nice, isn't it? Uh, and this, among this lower layer that we can keep, one particular type of uh, layer is called embedding. Okay, and the embedding, they are semantic model, a bit like latent semantic analysis that I presented before. They, they, that's also actually just uh, a representation, a semantic representation of the language in a high dimensional uh, space. Okay, and what you can do is you can say, okay. Uh, word computer is very close to word uh, mouse, okay? Uh, maybe, uh, or software is close to another word, etc. And other words are very far away. So you can uh, more or less automatically interpret a lot of uh, semantic information and it also encodes some syntactic morphological uh, information. So obviously deep learning has been used a lot for AES. Uh, I didn't here uh, report everything. So you have uh, one of the first work by uh, Ali Kanyotis et al. Uh, they, they train embedding to include also the score within the embedding. So it's a bit uh, more original than the basic approach. And you have also Dong and Zhang that did consider uh, a text as different level. So you will. I have uh, an essay is a set of sentence and a sentence is a set of word, which is obvious, okay? But the deep learning model basically doesn't have this information. It's just a sequence of word, okay? Uh, so that helps to have this type of architecture. And Dong et al, they introduce the mechanism of attention, okay? And this is a really big thing now, attention. So if you heard about BERT and transformer, uh, that is the big fuss uh, today in NLP, it is based on attention. Okay, so I will try to explain you very basically what is attention. Let's imagine uh, you want to translate how was your day into uh, comment se passe la journée. Okay, so classic system will just uh, take feature from four, the four words and try to predict comment, uh, se, etc. Okay, but with attention, you can say the model can by itself decide that, okay, I have to focus more on how uh, for comment, okay? But for ce pass, I should still here, you see, focus on how, but mostly on was. And your day is re not relevant to translate uh, was into uh, ce pass, okay? You see, so the, the, the model can by itself decide which part of the input is relevant to look at and that really helps, okay? Uh, that's why BERT is so efficient. And of course, there are a lot of work based on BERT also in automated SS querying, but I hadn't the time to, to include that. Now I will conclude with the opportunities and challenge. I don't know, I think I'm nearly done, okay. Um, so very briefly, uh, one challenge, as we already discussed, is assessing speech, okay? So there is a rich tradition already. If you are interested, this is a book uh, that uh, offers a synthesis of the work. Uh, the difficulty that we have with the speech is that uh, first, there is uh, always this issue of the error that uh, learners can do. Already for the written uh, case, this is a problem, not solve uh, issue. But in the speech, it's even worse because the uh, automatic speech recognition system will will not be able to tackle uh, error very well. Okay, and also we need to define specific feature to speech such as pronunciation, error, or, or vari variety, uh, fluency, etc. Uh, another big issue is cheating. Okay, uh, so there are different strategy. Uh, that have been discussed by Klebanov and Matnani in a, another very interesting synthesis on the field. Uh, one is the use of shell languages. So that's the part of discourse that doesn't really bring information, but that uh, will stru help structure. So for instance, uh, oh, one thing that I should say is blah, blah, blah. Or oh, we have to consider this, etc. And the point with this is you can use in any essay and it looks nice. So generally, uh, the automated SS system would 
uh, give good point if you use that. But if you use that just to cheat the system, that's a problem. Okay, you have the off-topic responses. Uh, you have the problem with plagiarism, and also, and probably this is a coming issue. Uh, it's already there, but I mean it will be probably much worse soon. You can automatically generate it essay. Okay, maybe you heard about this uh, Babel generator that uh, you can just give three keywords. So I gave uh, automated essay scoring, and it generated a text. So just here, this is an extract. You can see that the text make no sense. Okay, but it is uh, grammatical mostly, and it look it, it use a lot of fancy words. Okay, personally, I, maybe I don't know all the words. Um, so if you automatically assess that, that will be probably C1 or C2, wasn't it? Yeah. So we have to be very careful about that. Uh, the good news is that there, were, there is a work by Cahill and other, and they show that using some of the features that I described before, you can distinguish between those generated essay with the genuine one. So we are we will probably be able to uh, develop filter that can detect it. Of course, the gener as the generation system will be better and better, those filters might not work so well. So that's really uh, an issue for me. Uh, another issue is the interpretation and fairness, and that was also discussed before. Uh, so deep learning is known to be a problem for interpretation, okay? But actually that was already the case before. So can you interpret the SVM? Probably you can't, I, I can't, okay? Uh, but yeah, with deep learning, maybe the, the, the problem is a bit even uh, bigger because there are more uh, weight, there are more parameters in the model, so it's even more complex to interpret. But there are also a lot of work on that. And one possibility is what is called the attention map. Okay, so we can, uh, the, the model can automatically highlight some, the, the part of the text uh, on which if you remember the attention system that I explained, when he takes a decision, he will give more weight to some part of the text. Okay, and so we can visualize that, and then we can think that there is a connection between that and uh, the uh, interpretation of the decision. Okay, and there is a very uh, heated debate about that, and we have an introduction, a paper at ACL that uh, do an introduction to this debate. So if you are interested, you can have a look at the paper. Uh, and I think I will try to close. So there is also the issue of offering feedback, but uh, so there is also some work there. And uh, to conclude, you see that AES has several advantages, uh, cost saving, consistent, it may increase re reliability, uh, but it's also important to keep the human in the loop, you know, for, for, uh, prevent, uh, to, for preventing cheating, and uh, also to, for other reasons that was that were discussed this morning, uh, you also notice that uh, there is a lot of work for English, not so much for other language. So we should be careful about that, uh, considering multilingualism. And there are still a lot of challenge in the field. So if you're interested, please uh, contribute. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope that uh, it was interesting for you, and uh, I will. Thank you.